what's coming up on your horizon. Well, Oklahoma is a land of abundance. The crops we grow and the animals we raise here in the heartland literally feed people around the world. Yet we face a paradox when it comes to food availability here in the Sooner State. Today, we're re-examining the issue of what is called a food desert. Pockets of areas in Oklahoma where fresh food is hard to come by and where they are just may surprise you. And transportation becomes a huge issue in rural counties as the distance from the store increases. And so the options that are left are often convenience stores. Andy Barth takes us to Tulsa to see how one group is trying to solve the problem of food deserts with four wheels. Everybody wants real good food. That's the bottom line. We'll take a look at the movie premiere of the new film called Farmland. Some people still view farmers as the old guy on a rinkety tractor with overalls. And that's not the case at all. An intimate look at the people feeding your family. Public perception stereotype. Most people don't understand the farm. What does the public want to know? What do they need to know? And we'll end our day with an early taste of summer. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. Well, if you've been to the grocery store lately, you may have experienced sticker shock. Increases in food prices are surprising some and hurting others. Retail food prices have seen their largest increase since 2011, a result of a lingering drought. Wholesale beef prices have risen by 23% this past year, a result of drought thinned herds. Meanwhile, a virus outbreak in the hog population has pushed up pork prices by 56%. Other staples like milk and egg prices have also shot up, squeezing household budgets. And there may be more to come. Dry weather in California could mean higher prices for fruits and vegetables, while a growing demand for U.S. beef and pork could raise prices by about another 10% this year. Well, for some Oklahomans, fresh, healthy food is hard to come by no matter the price. While Oklahoma is an agricultural state, we also have several areas where there is limited access to fresh food. They're called food deserts and they remain a true paradox in this land of plenty. Today, we're gonna to take a look at one innovative solution, but before we do, here's some background. It's called a food desert, an area, whether rural or urban, where fresh food is simply unavailable. While inconvenient for some, for others, food deserts can contribute to everything from a neighborhood's decline to malnutrition and obesity. Stephen Eberly has been working on the problem for over five years. It's a food desert is a neighborhood where there's literally no place to find real food or whole food. That there are only convenience stores and, and fast food chains. That there is no place to buy a loaf of bread, milk, cheese, meats, dairy, and fresh vegetables. They literally don't exist. Now for many neighborhoods here in Tulsa, finding a local grocery store can be about a 10 mile trip. Not a huge problem if you're driving in a car, but if you're dependent upon public transportation or on foot, it makes finding fresh food virtually impossible. Here in West Tulsa, where windows are replaced with wood and grocery stores are all but non-existent, the Blue Jackalope serves as sort of a food oasis in what was a food desert. I started observing people in the neighborhood who didn't have access to a supermarket. We lost two major sized supermarkets within a, a 10 minute walk from here over the over the course of a couple of years. So Scott sparked his entrepreneurial spirit and started the Blue Jackalope, a neighborhood market that's an oasis of fresh food and warm fellowship. When I found out that a lot of my neighbors on food stamps 
existed off of going to convenience stores for their food source, it really kind of hit home. Scott's managed to turn his store into a one-stop shop for this community. In addition to providing an array of essential groceries and local produce, it's also a deli, a coffee bar, and perhaps best of all, a central hub of social activity. They'll sit down at the table, it's a communal table, and they'll start conversations with people and then they will do informal networking and that has gotten people who are underemployed or unemployed in the neighborhood day labor jobs. More than anything, it's just become a place where neighbors are meeting neighbors, whether within our community or, or across the broader scope of, of the city that we live in. Food deserts are not confined to just the inner city. Of Oklahoma's 77 counties, almost half are considered food deserts. All of these here in rural Oklahoma. And of these counties, nine are considered severe food deserts, which means it takes about a 10 mile trip to get to the local grocery store. And many of our rural residents are, uh, are elderly and also uh, lower income and we have higher poverty in rural populations. And transportation becomes a huge issue in rural counties as the distance from the store increases. And so the options that are left are often convenience stores um, or very small uh, grocer uh, type stores that lack selection and also tend to have higher prices. And while long stretches of road are often to blame in rural areas, it's the simple lack of transportation that limits others in Oklahoma City. Within the shadow of the state capitol, Kevin Johnson walks blocks past closed food stores to just pick up a bag of groceries. Well, yeah, they really kind of spread out around here. There ain't too many around here, so it's not, not really easy. You have to kind of just go, go a little ways or whatever. And when on foot, that's not so easy. At the intersection of MLK and 23rd, you can hear the vibrance of the neighborhood. Hometown Market is one of the last grocery stores in this area. Inside, the aisles are bright and the food is fresh, something store manager Chris Carter says has helped them succeed where others have not. Uh, we, we struggle hard and, and try hard to provide everything we can for a consumer that's looking for whatever product they may be looking for. Um, yes, I think we have a great produce department. Um, I think we have the freshest produce that any money can buy. So, and, and we work hard to do that, very hard. Carter says while he's proud of the fresh produce his store offers, he understands why some smaller retailers have abandoned the healthier fare. Ultimately, it's, it's a customer's choice. Um, you could provide them nothing but healthy foods, and that still doesn't mean they're going to buy it. We're killing ourselves in Oklahoma on the dollar menu. That's where we're eating, rich or poor, food stamps or not. We're eating processed food only, and it's killing us. We see children with type 2 diabetes that shouldn't have it at all, but they're obese. They're eating nothing but processed food full of sugars and salts, and, and, and that's the dilemma. A dilemma that Eberly and others believe can be solved by one healthy corner store at a time. Now we've been reporting on food deserts for several years now and since we shot this story the Oklahoma legislature passed legislation to allow for low interest loans to entrepreneurs who want to open healthy neighborhood markets in areas without a corner store. Now when we return we'll visit one such corner grocer that's not on the corner. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Well, if we are killing ourselves on the dollar menu, the answer could be as close as the fresh fruit and vegetable aisle at your local grocer, unless you can't get there. And that is why an innovative solution has rolled into Tulsa. Here's our Andy Barth. Well, Oklahoma ranks 44th in the nation when it comes to overall health. 30% of our adults are considered obese, and so are 17% of Oklahoma's children. Startling numbers that drove one group from Tulsa to find a way to get fresh, healthy food to all Oklahomans. From veggies yep. to fruits, the RNG grocery store gives customers the food they want, but couldn't always get. Everybody wants real good food. It's the bottom line. 
Katie Plohockey is the owner of RNG Grocery, a store that offers up fresh produce in an unusual way. This is the Real Good Food Truck. It's a mobile grocery store that goes to neighborhoods um, that are considered to be in food deserts. They have little or no access to fresh foods and also senior living facilities because of transportation difficulties. And today's stop, a senior living center in Tulsa. And waiting outside the store is resident Claudia Kleeman, who sees the mobile grocery as a real benefit. It's been a real blessing for our community because we've got 305 apartments and it's a senior community. They have to give up their cars and they, so they can't easily drive to the grocery. And because of this grocery store on wheels, Kleeman says her neighbors are now more independent. There have been some that have come down here and bought their own groceries the first time in maybe 10 years. And with their newfound freedom, customers have a lot to choose from. We have over 500 products. Um, we specialize in fresh fr produce, uh, vegetables and fruits. Uh, we also have some prepared meals, milk, eggs, cheese, yogurt. Uh, we carry limited toiletry items. Uh, we have uh, baking supplies, canned goods, cereals, uh, beverages, only healthy. We don't, you won't find pop on this store. Plo Hockey volunteers her time serving on her food truck and the money she does make goes right back to buy more food. Yet it's the people she serves who make it all worthwhile. I get excited every day when, you know, people say how blessed they are that we're here. And customer Francis Gott couldn't agree more. Saves me a trip to the big store, which I don't do very well. And Gott's neighbor, Leela Kirby, loves the accessibility and prices. It's convenient, price easy, and the prices are, are all, <laughs> this, this great. Are wow. And to offer such low prices, Plo Hockey says she does a lot of shopping. We opportunity shop, which means um, I shop all the sales at every single one of those stores have. So instead of them going to one store and getting one set of sales, they get the sales from every single store in a 30 mile radius. That one's 160. Mm -hmm. What a deal. It's a lot of work, but Plo Hockey says it's worth it to bring good food to good people. <laughs> we have a, an endemic in, in the United States with obesity and increased heart disease and type 2 diabetes in children. And, um, and I think that in the long run, by providing real good food to all, we can reduce our health costs. I mean, we spend $71 billion a year just on diabetes, which is a preventable disease. Couldn't we use that money to do better things and have a healthier community and quality of life. Well, you know, maybe we have Serving the community by providing quality, healthy food, which leaves her customers wanting more. I'll be back. Now, Plo Hockey says while this food truck does help a lot of people, she hopes to start another truck to serve even more. She also hopes to grow the business large enough so she can hire employees. Well, a new film is offering a glimpse into a world that we all use, but few of us understand. It's called Farmland, and it's a slice of life film from Academy Award director James Mall. When people see farmers, they think GMO, GMO, genetically modified organism. The term organic, Organically? certified organic. Well, natural. natural. I don't like to see anything as treated. Treating an animal humanely. It's just a corporation. We're a family farm. Clean food. The drought. drought. Will we run out of it? Public perception. Stereotype. Most people don't understand the farm. What does the public want to know? What do they need to know? We're not hiding anything, but what do you want to know? And letting viewers There's see firsthand is exactly what the documentary does. You can't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a rancher. It doesn't work that way. The number of people coming back to the family farm has decreased substantially. Farmland offers viewers an intimate and first-hand glimpse into the lives of six young farmers and ranchers. When I started, no one believed in me. <sighs> Nobody. Examining a passion for a way of life that's been passed down from generation to generation, yet continues to evolve. This now this is pretty tall. This is the legacy we are carrying on. A challenge that many of those at the movie's Oklahoma City premiere know all too well. Roy Lee Lindsay is with the Oklahoma Port Council. I think there's a disconnect sometimes between the people buying food and the people raising food, and, and there's a belief that we're not the same. 
And I think this film goes a long way to showing that, hey, we have the same challenges on the farm that you do at the grocery store, whether it's new family members, whether it's losing family members, whatever it is. I, I think that really comes through in the film. And I hope that's what people take out of it is that there really is a, a, a similarity, a likeness between all of us, whether we're involved in buying food or producing food. Now, Farmland began its national theatrical release on May 1st and can currently be found in several movie theaters around the state. Most Americans are five generations removed from the farm, and each generation gets a little farther. Some people still view farmers as the old guy on a rinkety tractor with overalls. And that's not the case at all. We're just like everyone else. We just have different jobs. We're normal. The core of it is still growing and producing something, but the way we do it has changed. We've got way more technology. We've got way better equipment. If this is representative, you have more melons than I have. <laughs> well, after the film's Oklahoma City premiere, I visited with four young farmers and ranchers from across the state to see what brought them back to the farm. It's what I want to do. It's my passion working on the dairy farm, being able to produce a quality product for the for the people around the world i mean i feel we do a great job taking care of our cows and the land that we raise them on and it's something i love especially since it's with my family nobody works harder or takes better care of their animals than we do we take great pride in what we do we love what we do and we work very very hard to do what we do and if there's anything i could say is we try and make it a better place or a a better farm or ranch for that next generation coming up. My husband's dad and grandpa used to always tell us, if you take care of the land, it'll take care of you. And that's what we try and do and want to do. Uh, so many things, uh, since I've been out of college, I feel like we've been, two of the last three years have been drought. Uh, you, you, you work so hard and, and, uh, and so, many, so many variables go into it. And, and one little thing can, can go wrong and, and cause you to have a short crop. And, like the old, some old timers always told me, a, a short crop sometimes can, can have a long tail. And so, you know, you've you, you got to save in the good times and so that you can, you can weather the storm. So, Bert, what are some of your takeaways from seeing this? Uh, I, I really enjoyed the, 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 how it demonstrated how much risk and how much capital it takes to get this started, you know. And I feel like a, a particular one said in there, he talked about his 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 father had passed it on for the next generation and that's that really hit home with me because that's what my parents have done and with uh, four kids of our own coming up you know that's kind of the kind of the same path I want to take I want to I want to be able to have the operation big enough to where they could take it over if they choose to you know and uh, it just I want to be able to give them the same opportunities my parents have been able to give me so I just it really showed the struggles really express the struggles and the rewards very well. Now all of the Oklahomans we talked to after the movie are part of multi-generational farms, but not everyone is so lucky. Land prices are at record highs and equipment costs can easily reach six figures, making it difficult for a new beginning farmer to start out. That's why under the new farm bill, the USDA is trying to help those new to agriculture. Bob Ellison reports. The Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program, or BFRDP, will help a new generation get into agriculture. With $100 million from the new farm bill, the U.S. Department of Agriculture will help train and educate new farmers and ranchers. Average age of our farmers is 58 years old, and so we need the bench. We need to get folks coming into agriculture who either grew up on a farm and are thinking about coming back but also folks who don't know much about agriculture but have that drive, that passion, who want to, want to get into farming or ranching. And part of BFRDP's funding will help limited resource and socially disadvantaged beginning farmers and ranchers and military veterans get started. We're targeting these groups of folks to give them the very special tools they may need, the uniqueness of their questions or concerns that they may have in getting into agriculture. So it's really a target of funds to these areas. For more information, go to nifa.usda.gov. Want to share something you've seen here today? Well, all of our episodes are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV. Or you can subscribe to our weekly free podcast on iTunes. Finally today, an early taste of summer. Few things can start a morning any better than a biscuit covered in jelly. 
And as my waistline can attest, I've become quite the connoisseur. And no one does jelly any better or with more unique fruit than a mom and pop operation called Gigi's Gourmet Goodies. Just to make sure that the pectin's dissolved. When the pot's are boiling, for years I've made jelly. And the sugar's added. Sugar goes in. Something special is coming out of Kit Peterson's kitchen. When Les and I decided to build out here, I said, you know, I'd really like to have a commercial kitchen. And so began Gigi's Gourmet Goodies. Handmade jellies from the freshest ingredients. When we first bought the land, it was completely overgrown. As we started clearing the land, we discovered that we had these huge old fruit trees. Old heritage pear trees to be exact. And from these, a new product line was born. Uh, Kit, my wife, started with vanilla pear and then rum pear, uh, and I had noticed online at one time a cinnamon pear with a stick of cinnamon in it. And so we started doing those and that's actually become our best seller. But certainly not their most unusual. The most unique we have is the prickly pear cactus. When you're picking it, uh, you need to be very careful. You don't touch it with your hands. Uh, and of course, every now and then someone comes up to me and says, now exactly what kind of a pear tree grows the prickly pear? A question Les and Kit don't mind at all about an endeavor they've grown to love. Apparently at some point in my life when I can't remember when said that I would be willing to sell it. As reluctant as he is to admit that he said yes, he said yes. And they began selling Gigi's Gourmet goodies to local stores in Norman. Sales took off, but fruit production didn't. Second year is when the series drought started and the first week of July, the trees dropped all their fruit. So we drilled a well to have it available for the next year, which was last summer. And last summer we watered them, we babied them, in spite of the drought, we had this beautiful, beautiful crop of pears. And waiting for them to ripen, apparently we were not alone because the deer and the squirrels and the crows and God knows what else, raccoons probably, managed to completely strip the trees in one weekend. So Les found himself moving from sales to procurement, finding apples in New Mexico until a wildfire destroyed that orchard, and now going all the way to Colorado. But if anybody has a tree that they'd like us to come pick their apples, we'll be more than happy to do that. That's because Gigi prides itself with being handmade and homegrown, members of the Made in Oklahoma program. We get to put that on our product now, uh, and it helps a lot. Once we got that, it began to help the sales and that folks are nowadays liking or enjoying uh, buying local. And when it comes to Gigi's Gourmet Goodies, you can't get any more local than Kit Peterson's Kitchen. Now, jelly making is a second career for both Kit and Les. Les is a retired airline pilot, and Kit still practices law but says she looks forward to the day she can put on the apron full time. You can keep up with us throughout the week. Just head to OKHorizon.com where you can see more of any of our stories, read our reporters behind the scenes blogs, see what others are saying about us on Twitter, and face the facts with our regular updates. So reach out and touch us anywhere and anytime. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we'll take you inside a student organization that could well determine the success of our nation's economy. It's the American workforce, which at its core, with its energy and enthusiasm, is a great advantage for America. Getting them enabled with skills restores America, creates an American renaissance, and assures our economy in the future. Skills USA, on Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, one of my favorite local economists is famous for saying the cure for high prices is high prices. Essentially, when an item hits a price point higher than people want to pay, then people start buying less of it. And I saw that economic theory become economic reality last weekend. It was spring cleaning time in the McClendon household, and after a long day's hard work, we decided to treat ourselves to prime rib. So we found a recipe and headed off to buy the 10 pound prime rib it called for. Thankfully, we're at a point in our lives when it comes to food, we don't do a lot of price comparison shopping when we grocery shop. 
Food here in the U.S. is relatively cheap. In fact, as a nation, our food bill as part of our overall income is smaller than anywhere else in the world. So when my wife asked the butcher for that 10 pound prime rib, she didn't ask about the price. And to her surprise, at the checkout counter, it was $9.75 a pound. And I'll let you do the math. And it was at that point, my wife became a price conscious shopper. Sure, we still will buy steak, but probably less of it and check the price before we do. Nationwide, the U.S. beef herd is at its smallest point since 1942, and global demand for meat is increasing, hence the rise in prices. But if my family is any indication, and the laws of supply and demand are still valid, the cure for those high prices is once again high prices. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching. See you back here next week.